please help me welcome back to the lecture, our Toastmaster for the day. Thank you, thank you so much. We have completed our speech evaluation contest, and we go into the final contest for this morning, and it is the humorous speech contest. As always, just a few housekeeping matters we need to take care of before we begin. If you used your cell phone or your alarming device during that 10 minute break, we need you to once again shut it off so that we will not at all interrupt our contestants for the control. Once this contest has begun, the sergeant at arms will secure the doors. If members of the audience are asked to refrain from leaving or entering the room during the contest, and most certainly during the time that our speakers are going to speak. After the contest, please do not leave the room until it is determined that all ballots have been collected. Please check to see if any devices, again, such as cell phones or pages, need to be turned off. If they're not turned off, you can put them in the silent mode. <laughs> that one. Okay. <laughs> all right. I now want to begin by giving you the speaking order. We will have seven contestants this afternoon, and they will come in this order. Madam Chief Judge, do we need the contestants outside of the room? Yes, please. Okay. They, they need to see them for one, all contestants for just one brief moment outside. Make certain that we can confirm the speech times. Okay? I got that part right this time. We do need them outside. <laughs> okay. Here's the order that our humorous speech contestants will be coming to the lecture. Speaker number one, Claire Donovan. Claire Donovan will be speaker number one. Speaker number two, Matthew Walsh. Matthew Walsh will be speaker number two. Speaker number three, Marsha Northern. Marsha Northern will be speaker number three. Speaker number four, Orlando Davis. Orlando Davis is speaker number four. Speaker number five, Walter Johnson. Walter Johnson is speaker number five. Speaker number six, Chuck Byrne. Chuck Byrne is speaker number six. The final speaker number seven, George Staples. George Stapleton will be speaker number seven. There will be a minute of silence before the first contestant and between each contestant. Timekeepers advise you to make note of that. We'll have to begin the one minute of silence. Please signal me so that we will begin. After all contestants have spoken, the judges will be given time to mark the ballots. <coughs> and we'll give you as much time as needed between each contestant to allow you one moment after the completion of speaking with that contestant. With that being said, let the contest begin. <laughs> Barry, I kind of know what that means, right? <laughs> uh, salt, please. Yeah, right. <laughs> but anyway, we would have sure. a couple of seconds because we need to give you some information before you start. Okay. Thank you. Right. Need just a couple of seconds before they come. And this is important. You know, any, how many people have been in a speech contest? 
And how many people know how your guts feel like they're in your throat when you're at a speech conference? <laughs> I'm telling you. And I don't care how seasoned. You know, just FYI. Yeah. <laughs> I don't care how seasoned you are. I don't care how much you have prepared. Somehow, it's just a blur. People say, when you were in the World Championship, did you know you were going to win? When I was in the World Championship, I didn't even know if I could make it to the stage. <laughs> I'm telling you, you could have cut the tension with a knife. And then I had a little testimonial while we're waiting. I had the brilliant <laughs> idea that my speech might go over time. It just might go over time. And so the night before, we were in Washington, D.C. I, I looked at my speech, I looked at my speech, I looked at my speech, and I said, there are portions of the speech I just don't really think I need. So I'm going to cut this out to make certain I don't go over time. And I got on stage, and I was going, it was flowing, and right as I got ready to go to a close, the green light wasn't on. <laughs> now the only thing worse than giving a speech too long is giving a speech that's too short because you will be disqualified. However, I have another profession as a Baptist minister. <laughs> so I know I'm <laughs> and as I slowed down and tried to really get my face together, the green light came on. But at the end of the speech, Dan McCroy will be here for our District 30 conference. You're going to want to be here. He said, Ed, you had the shortest speech of everybody there. I think I was a little over six minutes, six minutes or something. And I said, you won't believe what I did. I cut a part of that speech out. So I want to warn you, if you feel like your speech is too long, and you cut things out, particularly if you're the night before, time the speech. Because unless you're good at stretching things out, if it's too short, you will be disqualified from time. But most of us have the opposite problem. We're just afraid to go too long. Most of us don't have a problem, you know, stretching it out. So it was really a scary thing. But I, I'm so glad because Toastmasters has helped. It has helped me. One of the things, one of our, our target speakers talking about young people, and I just enjoy talking to him. What I shared this morning about the young lady asking me, was I a slave? <laughs> she was really serious. But at 53, I still think I'm young. I really, really do. Oh, <laughs> my dad says that you still got milk on your breast. <laughs> it's because you're 95, man. Not that I'm young, you're old. You know? But the reality is, just being able to stand in front of an audience. And people ask me, what do you think you give most to the audience? When you can give people hope. This is a true story. I gave a speech in Cook County Jail years ago. It's been over 10 years ago. And a guy comes and says, I give a speech a year later. I'm out on the L at 95th in the damn line. And a guy comes up and he says, Ed Hearn. This is before I'm the world champion, right? He shakes my hand. He says, you're a speaker, right? I said, yeah. He tells me the speech I gave, the title of the speech I gave. The three points of the speech I gave. And he said, when I listened to that speech, and the speech was, don't let anybody define your life for you. <clears throat> you make your decisions and you live with your consequences. You have your life in your hand. Do what you can. He gave me that speech and he said, I want you to know that changed my life. He said, I got out of jail, I got married, and I've never gone back to jail. That's the power of the speech. <laughs> Um, Chief Judge, are we ready? Yes, she can start with the first contestant, and we will give you the information for the remainder at the one minute break. It was just getting good to me, though. I mean, I, got, I ain't got a sermon if you want to stay. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. All right. It's Sunday. <laughs> it's Saturday, but Sunday's on the way. So okay. Our first contestant, our first contestant for the Humor Speech Contest, again, is Claire Donovan. The title of the speech, A Hot Time in Kankakee. A Hot Time in Kankakee. Oh, Thank you. Dignitaries, Mr. Toastmaster, fellow Toastmasters and guests. It was not funny in 1970. But I can chuckle about it now. My sister-in-law, Patty, is obsessive. She loves to decorate her house. 
she doesn't like is for people to actually walk on her carpet. To that end, she knocked the back wall out of a closet in the den so that people could walk through the closet. Yes, you heard me right. Walk through the closet to get to the enclosed front porch used as a family room. She didn't want people walking through her museum-like dining and living room. But nature does not respect perfectionism. My husband Jim got a call from his sister Patty. It was an SOS to come down to Kankakee immediately to help them put a new roof in the house because it had been struck by lightning. Yowza! <laughs> <laughs> we arrived in Kankakee to a messy scene. The roof was split, and the family room was partially separated from the house. It was as if a giant woodsman had wielded his axe and cleaved the family room from the house as easily as chopping wood. The family room was a inch deep in water, half of which was from Gaddy's tears. <laughs> <laughs> to make matters worse, it was 102 degrees in the shade. The sun bore down on us like a blowtorch. We had to get the roof on the house before another storm came in, so my husband Jim joined Patty's husband Rich up on the roof with his friends. While well, Patty and I drove to the store to get a shop vac to suck up all that water and tears <laughs> from the uh, rock, from the red, white, and blue shag carpet. <laughs> <laughs> I drove because Patty was her clout. The steering wheel felt as if it were 150 degrees. So Patty had to sit right next to me and help with the turns. And I'd start the turn, and then Patty would lean in, turn the wheel a little more, and then I would finish the turn. Our palms were ruby red. Our guys had it worse. They were up on that hot roof with shovels, removing three layers of old roofing while the unforgiving sun was beating down on their bare, blistering backs. When we got back from the store, Rich called, Patty! I mean, actually, he probably was doing it. <laughs> get my cigarettes. Patty got a pack of cigarettes and tossed them up and then tossed up a pack of wooden matches. The hapless rich spilled the entire box of matches on the roof and they scattered. Mm -hmm. Patty, heaving an annoyed sigh, threw a broom up to Rich so that he could sweep the matches off the roof. However, a match doesn't know if it's being swept Oops. or not. <laughs> and several of them lit and caught the roof on fire. <laughs> Patty and I scrambled and we got a hold, we got it up to Rich. And he was able to put out the fire. Now, the family room, a bedroom, and the pristine dining room had water damage. Patty was on the verge of collapse. A little later, I said, that's odd. I smell smoke, and that fire's been out for a while. Patty and I followed the acrid odor of smoke up to a second floor bedroom, where a fan had fallen out of the window, the motor was hot, and it caught the carpet on fire. <laughs> Patty and I got buckets of water and put the fire out. Patty cried, I'm going to go out and run in the street 
and lie down and ask somebody to try back and forth on it. <laughs> they did manage to finish their roof with no further catastrophes. The rugs were sucked dry and Patty's blood pressure returned to normal. <laughs> Jim and I returned gratefully to our intact apartment in the city. This speech has a happy ending. Patty had the perfect excuse to redecorate the entire house. <laughs> Well, I've been thinking about it a little bit, and I 
I think I've come up with a couple of ways that you can tell. So, with apologies to the well-known comedian Jeff Foxworthy, from whom I stole this idea, I'd like to present you with a little thing I call, you may be a Toastmaster. For example, if you're one of the rare people in the world who know the difference between a lectern and a podium, <laughs> you may be a Toastmaster. If when you hear someone say podium when they mean lectern, it drives you nuts, you may be a Toastmaster. <laughs> If you know your club number by heart, better than you know your home phone number, <laughs> you may be a Toastmaster. <laughs> if you've ever found yourself in front of a judge, and when he says, how do you plead, you begin your response by saying, thank you, Mr. Tabletop Expansion. <laughs> <laughs> you may be a Toastmaster. To give the eulogy at the funeral of a person you've never met, <laughs> you may be a Toastmaster. If at that same funeral, the widow of 90 years gives her last heartfelt, tearful goodbye to her husband, and she turns and slowly walks back to her seat, you whip out one of these things. <laughs> You may be a Toastmaster. <laughs> 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 Lastly, and, and this one for the ladies in the audience. If you're ever walking on a moonlit night with your boyfriend and he takes you by the hand and she was right in the eye, if he tells you you're the most beautiful girl he's ever seen, that he, he can't imagine a world without you at his side. If he goes down on one knee and pulls out his mother's engagement ring, Tom is doing pretty good. <laughs> goes by <the> Kardashian. <laughs> and he asks you for your hand in marriage. And your response is no. Because I counted three ums, two uh -huh. concentrating on what's in front of you. Let's see those hands. <laughs> and lastly, raise your right hands one more time if you want to give me five dollars. <laughs> nobody? Nobody? <laughs> Good for you, Toastmasters. <laughs> Mr. Toastmasters. Matthew Walsh, listen up, Toastmasters. <laughs> Let's give one moment of silence as our judges mark the God. Contestant number three. Contestant number three is Marsha Northern. Her speech entitled, I Have a Dream. I Have a Dream. Marsha Northern. I don't know my club number. 
member. So I don't know if I'm quite a Toastmaster. I'm new to Toastmasters. I've only been a member for a few months. And I like to consider myself to be in a dating phase with Toastmasters. So in the spirit of dating, I'd like to tell you a little something about myself, some things that people don't always, that I don't always tell people. Today I want to share with you that I have a dream. I like saying that. It's like a nine-year-old doing a speech. I have a dream. I'm a dreamer. And one of my dreams that I would like to share with you today is about my secret desire. I have a job. I'm one of the lucky employed people, but I have this desire to get a new job at some point, and I don't usually share it with people. But I want to be a hostess. And you might say, <laughs> okay, I'm okay. <laughs> a hostess is when you go in one of these nice restaurants and they have this lady, when you walk in the door, she comes out with a pretty dress and she gives you a menu and she takes you to your table and she chit chats with you and that's a hostess. That's the type of hostess that I would like to be. Now you might want to say, why do you want to be a hostess, Marcia? Do you like fine dining? Not really. My idea of fine dining is going to Olive Garden or Applebee's. But I do like something about fine dining. I work in a psychiatric facility. And so at the psychiatric facility, we eat with the patients to try and give them that sense of community. So normally when I'm eating lunch, I'm like ducking because a patient might be throwing the chair. So <laughs> you know, in a nice restaurant, I can be assured that there will be no ducking. <laughs> is I like to, I like the idea of wearing a pretty dress. This is the real reason that I want to be a hostess. Because <laughs> my hobby on weekends is buying these pretty dresses, and there's not much cost for wearing these dresses or the matching shoes. <laughs> when I go to Applebee's or to Olive Garden. <laughs> so this is my main reason for wanting to be a hostess. Also, a third reason is I like talking to strangers. Like you guys today, I like talking to strangers. I can hold a conversation with anybody for 10 minutes. And after 10 minutes, I don't find them interesting, and I'm sure it's going to be interesting. That's why I like to be a hostess. Now, I don't normally tell my dreams to because they don't appreciate, in this society, we don't appreciate dreamers. We don't appreciate the idea that you have no plan, you have no goal. I don't have an objective. I don't know how or if I'll ever become a hostess. I don't care. It's just a dream, something I hold in the back of my head. You know, my husband says, why are you buying another dress? I said, because someday I'm going to become a hostess. <laughs> Are you interested in being a hostess, I mean a waitress, or a server? 
Well, that's not my dream. I don't want to be a waitress or a server. I just want to share a vision. <laughs> <laughs> I happened to share for the first time ever with this dream with a friend of mine at work. And one of my friends said, well, Marsha, you know, if you want to accomplish this dream, once a thing, thinking it's a goal, why don't you take the job as a waitress and then you'll have some restaurant experience to put on your resume? It's not my dream to carry a tray. I don't want to be a waitress. I want to be a hostess. We don't share visions. So in the spirit of Martin Luther King and the dedication of his memorial last week, I have to say, I have a dream. I have a lot of dreams. And what happens when you defer a dream? You just put it back in your bag and wait till next time. <laughs> Now for contestant number four. Contestant number four is Orlando Davis. His speech entitled, This is for the Cool. This <laughs> is for the Cool, Orlando Davis. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Toastmaster, <laughs> fellow Toastmaster, dignitaries, and especially our guests. I got a question. Who in this room considers themselves cool? Raise your hand. <laughs> Not many of you raise your hand, but that's okay. <laughs> I would argue that in America, cool, being cool is important. My life has been dedicated on this road to being cool. <laughs> and I can remember watching my favorite TV show with a character actor by the name of Henry Winkler. Does anybody know the name of this show? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Henry played which, which actor? Which Fonzie? <laughs> Fonzie. If you had one word to describe Fonzie, how would you describe Fonzie? Cool. 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 <laughs> so I spent all of my life trying to mimic Arthur Fonzie Now as I got older, I sort of expanded that to Samuel Jackson, Rock and Roll, Cuba Goody, right? <laughs> and I'm saying all that to say one thing, that I want to establish the fact that I am cool. Have I established that fact? Am I cool? <laughs> so in the next few minutes that I have remaining, I want to tell you about a little story of an interaction I had with my 15-year-old who questioned my coolness. <laughs> and after that, I want to help someone in this room who was struggling like I was, trying to find themselves as cool. You ready? Ready. <laughs> True story. I've been in my kitchen doing some domestic work, not really sure what I was doing, but I decided that I wanted to listen to some music. So I whip out my phone, my iPhone, put it on top of my refrigerator into my device called an iHome and I press my first playlist. Now the question, what happens to someone who hears their favorite song? What usually happens? Yes. Yes. You start to dance. So I'm going to tell you I'm cool, so I started here, and I used to start with a little rock. Oh, oh, and I started. And I don't know, I think I was doing the temptation. Who walks into the room to bust up my party? But my 15-year-old girl walks in, turns, 
with a disdainful look, looks me up and down and said, Dad, what are you doing? <laughs> I'm going to be honest. I got a little carried away. By the time she looked at me, I was... <laughs> Either I accept what she's saying as face value, or I look at her and label her as a hater who looked like cool if it fell out the refrigerator and landed on her head. <laughs> who in this audience believes that I chose number two? <laughs> Correct the money. You are a hater. You would not know cool if it fell out the refrigerator and landed on your head. As a matter of fact, ask your mama. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I had hit right by me. I responded with the actual mama response. So I had to get out of there. And the only card that I had left was my daddy card. So it went something like this. I am your father. I don't even know why I'm responding to you. As a matter of fact, I'm, I'm, I'm leaving. And I grabbed my phone intentionally and I walked. As slow as <laughs> cool as I do. Before I walked through that pressure, I turned around, I looked at her, and I said, hmm. I'm talking about, I don't know what cool means. Truth be told, I went back to my bedroom, and I sat down on my bed, and I contemplated the claim I had just made. <laughs> I went back over my life saying, grade school. Was I cool? Yeah. Of course I was cool. Are you kidding me? High school, was I? Was I really cool in high school? Are you kidding me? I was the coolest dude in high school, no shadow of a doubt, no doubt. College, are you kidding? No party got started unless I was at the party. So I know then that I was cool. In the middle of this process, I decided I stopped and say, enough! I am not going to let anyone from this point forward define for me what cool is. And I want to help someone who is struggling with that right now. <laughs> if you feel that wearing white socks up to your kneecaps with a nappy robe is your outfit to walk out to the mailbox and check for your mail, and you think it's cool, then it's cool. <laughs> if you think wearing spandex from head to toe to a health club, and you've expanded a little bit more than what you remember, <laughs> if you think it's cool, then it's cool. <laughs> If you're 75 years old and you have on a pair of Timberland boots, Sean John jeans sagging <coughs> off your butt, an oversized shirt, baseball cap turned to the back, and you're 75 and you think it's cool, then it's cool. This is the bottom line. Define it for yourself. Coolness is a state of mind. It is a purpose. <coughs> <laughs>
Contestant number five is Walter Johnson. The speech entitled, The Price You Pay for Good Food. The Price You Pay for Good Food, Mr. Walter Johnson. How many of you love good food? Let me see a show of hands. How many of you have an acquired taste for food? Let me see a show of hands. And I'm going to share an experience that I had this past summer. I was coming back from downtown on my way to my office and I had missed lunch and I thought about, I want something to eat. I said, hmm, I got an acquired taste for something. Now, before I tell you the name of the place where I wanted to get it, it kind of rhymes with where most people go on Sunday. I know you're thinking about shopping mall, <laughs> grocery store. What about playing golf? What if I said Wednesday night Bible class? Any hints? What is it? Churches. Churches. I had a taste, a quiet taste of churches. <laughs> I'm coming back from downtown, and I get off the air, I mean my limousine, and I'm thinking, I'm approaching the restaurant, and I can see from here to the doorway, it's like 20 or 30 people in line. And I'm thinking, man, that must be some good chicken. Let me hear you say, good chicken. Good chicken. Good chicken. 20 or 30 people in line. So I go to the restaurant, and the layout was similar to this. This was like the hallway and that was the cash register. And there's 20 or 30 or 40 people in line. You go this way and you cross and you come to the register. So, did I tell you about this happened to be Tuesday too? <laughs> Churches have a special on Tuesday. 99 cents for two pieces of chicken open. 99 cents. Now, the neighborhood called it, churches call it a special, but in the neighborhood, they call it a miracle. <laughs> 99 cents for two pieces of chicken. So when people say, I'm going to church, do they mean churches or church? You know, you got to ask what day of the week is it. <laughs> so I'm getting in line, and it's 85 degrees inside. Oh. It's smoking, but I'm thinking, I got an acquired taste. <laughs> and being a Toastmaster, I'm thinking, time management, Toastmaster. <laughs> so I'm thinking, I think about it ahead of time, and I'm going to take some reading material. So I'm reading my current Toastmaster. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm in line. And I can see some other people that had this time management thought, too. It was a couple ladies folding some clothes. <laughs> Some 
she pulled off a scarf, and she had this little, I don't know, coat or something. She pulled it off, and Granny was built. <laughs> I mean, I don't know if she had been taking a tabo, <laughs> she had been taking a ballet, but Granny was hot. And I had this hard conversation, and I forgot all about Toast <laughs> Let me tell you a little bit about my life 
growing up before I get into that story. You see, I grew up in a cozy ranch, raised ranch house on the south side of Chicago in a friendly neighborhood. The only problem with that picture was I lived in a house with three sisters. Now, please don't get me wrong. I love women. But the reality is women are just different than men. You see, men, women do these quirky little things that guys just don't get. Take, for instance, a telephone. Women, we tend to use the phone as a communication tool to send out short messages. A girl, on the other hand, will take off for several weeks with that same girl, a girlfriend, and upon returning home, catch up with that telephone and talk for the next three and a half hours. <laughs> it's a known scientific fact that the average number of items in a bathroom are 437 that women own. It's also a known scientific fact. The average man has no clue what they are. <laughs> How could he even if he get in there? And what's with all those shoes? Well, I had no thoughts of becoming a, a hostess. <laughs> but, so I knew that I needed to get out of that house. And I constantly spent a lot of my time hanging out with the guys in the neighborhood which was really cool, until one day one of my sisters had the bright idea that she was a tomboy and started hanging out with the guys. Now, that was bad enough in and of itself, but then, when she started getting selected before me and pick up games of football, <laughs> that was totally over the top. And then to add salt to an already festering wound, she scored the winning touchdown. <laughs> now, growing up, I loved to play Cowboys and as a matter of fact, I had an original Buffalo Bill Wild West bow and arrow set, complete with rubber-tipped arrows. And I completely remember, clearly, one day, taking one of those arrows and firing it over this concrete porch. My sister happened to be hiding behind that porch, and she chose the wrong moment to stand up, and she took the arrow right on the other forehead. I remember her clearly screaming with that arrow impaled in her, in her forehead, all the way home. The Indians got me! The Indians got me! The Indians got me! Well, that was the last straw that sent me off to military school. <coughs> military school. Remember that part about wanting to spend more guy time? Be careful for it. <laughs> well, I didn't complain too much. It would not have mattered. Besides, I had a friend by the name of Ron, and I take comfort in the fact that Ron's title in life was even worse than mine. You see, Ron lived on the edge. Ron lived in a house with seven sisters. Seven sisters and one bathroom. Oh, wow. Talk about the issue. Now, there's a lot that you could probably say about that. But one thing that a lot of guys said, that that's probably one of the reasons why he became such a great two-step dancer. Now, I must say that Ron spent most of his formative years growing up in the local gas station. Now, you talk about, think about it. A gas station really has everything that a young guy would want. Access to a telephone that he can actually get. <coughs> the sweet smell of gasoline. <laughs> and a toilet. Access to a toilet. With no one to yell at him about leaving the seat up or not. <laughs> well, after a while, Ron started getting really you see, he started to find his sisters. Something you just don't do. You don't mess with the world's last superpower. <laughs> <laughs> After that, he started having this weird paranoid twitch. From sleep deprivation, he grew these dark bags under his eyes. And then he started walking with this really weird limp. Well, after a while, I totally lost contact with Ron. Ended up graduating from military school. From there, I went to college where I met she who must be obeyed. <laughs> my wife had not yet acquired that problem. It wasn't until the years after we were married. See, she used to quote scripture to me, telling me that the man is the head of the household. And this really made me feel good until I found out years later that the woman is the neck that turns that head. <laughs> <laughs> I purchased this cozy little house in this friendly little neighborhood. Proceeded to have three daughters. We even had a dog. Female dog. I knew then that I needed to do something. 
things started getting weird. That female quirky thing started happening more and more and more frequently. So I went out and I got myself a golden retriever. And he was my buddy. They neutered him shortly after I got this. <laughs> So then I knew I really had to do something. I went out and I talked to an architect and I had him draw a, a bathroom. Now, my idea of a bathroom and she who must be obeyed to have a bathroom were slightly different. You see, my idea of a bathroom was a toilet and a sink. We ended up sinking, all right. Hundreds of thousands of dollars into that remodel. We got a family room, we got a master bedroom. We got a library. We got an entire second story. But we did get a bathroom, finally. And I must say that I would have never thought that something as mundane as sitting on the throne could have ever left me feeling like a king. <laughs> Final contestant for the Humor Speech Contest is contestant number seven, George Stapleton. His speech entitled, A Mother in Need of Rehab. A Mother in Need of Rehab. Welcome, Mr. George Stapleton. <laughs> My three-year-old twin granddaughters and I are at an ideal age for nursery rhymes. But I've been reacquainting myself with this lady's rhymes, and my, oh my, some of them are quite inappropriate for tiny ears. <laughs> that old lady who lives in a shoe with too many kids? She feeds them tasteless broth, beats them, sends them to bed. I want to call DCFS. <laughs> <laughs> Old Mother Hubbard, after finding no bone for her dog in the cupboard, goes to the store to buy him some bread and returns home to find him dead. What a nice story for her. <laughs> little tots to sleep. <laughs> Sing a song of sixpence, a pocket full of rum. Very nice, but what comes next? Four and twenty blackbirds baked alive. <laughs> Five. Now there's a situation for Peter. <laughs> but there's more. A maid is in the garden hanging out clothes, and one of those blackbirds flies out of the pie and bites off her nose. No. <laughs> Remember the Sprats? Jack who could eat no fat, and his wife who couldn't eat no meat? Now there's a couple in dire need of medical <laughs> But between the two of them, they lick their plates clean. <laughs> this is a classic case of a very young 
healthy mutual codependency. <laughs>
judges have finished with panels, could you please pass them to our other counties? And our chief judge will alert us with all the counties. Toastmaster, we have all of the ballots. Thank 
Rico Davis.
is on December 2nd at the Crown Plaza in O'Hare. Lance Miller will be giving a free evening workshop on all sorts of speaking tips and techniques. Why? Because we're all Toastmasters and we can't wait to go. And then lastly, I think I said it already, so we'll start sneaking one more in. December 10th, TLI, we're going to have a special super duper lunchtime group. Again, lunch there is about $15 to $18. It's going to be really exciting, something we've never done before, and you're going to want to watch out for that. And you get all this super cool information, because I know you want to text it on your phone right now, <laughs> at the D30 website, d 30 postmasterscorg Thank you for having me at your contest. It's been a great one. Thanks for testing. Well, my duties as Toastmasters, a uh, Toastmaster, have now come to a close, but we get down to the part that everybody wants to hear the winners of our contest. Yeah. And I'm going to call our division governor, Mr. Mike Casey, who's going to come and take it from this place. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Toastmaster. Before we do that, I would just like to thank all the functionaries that helped make this contest possible, starting with Ed Hearn, our Toastmaster for the day. And our chief judge for today's contest is Carolyn Arthur. Tony Williams acted as our chief timer today. Sergeants at Arms, Brenda Lee and Pat Martin. And of course, we got our judges. I can't recognize you in public because the judges are to remain anonymous. Let's get it. And finally, I would like to thank everyone who brought food today. We had some great food and Everyone, again, who helped make this contest possible. And now if I could have Michelle Cable come up and help me present the awards. Governor Kyle Rohde, if you could join us as well. Evaluation contest first. The third place winner in the South Division Evaluation Contest today is Ron Lorsch.
and I think victory in the in the district contest on November 12th, Mr. Dave Roberson. <laughs> Toastmasters, first time for us, we'll be at the Broadview Library in conjunction with a partnership for a community <coughs> read. It's the last lecture, bestseller 2008. This is an individual with terminal cancer. We're going to be hosting that. So please come out. That is on the 16th of November, 638, Broadview Library. Thank you. All right. <laughs> now the winners for the South Division Humor Speech Contest. Third place, Mr. Walter Johnson. Thank you very much. 